Hello, and welcome to Japan Media Tour. I'm your host, Stephen TM, and today we're going to be talking about yokai. Before we get into it, though, the goal of this podcast is to examine Japanese media in order to gain an understanding of Japanese culture at large. And this episode will be absolutely vital in terms of laying the foundation of knowledge for us to build around in future episodes. So, we won't be talking specifically about any one movie or show. And instead, we'll be touching on a variety of topics to do with yokai. Now, yokai run absolutely rampant throughout Japanese media, especially in manga, anime, and video games. It's quite difficult to define the word yokai in a concise manner, so we'll use examples and stories throughout the episode in order to wrap our heads around the concept. But first, I'll just give an oversimplified, Somewhat flawed definition in order to get the ball rolling. Simply put, yokai are an assortment of demons, ghosts, and monsters in Japanese folklore. The term yokai is loosely related to kami, which we've discussed in previous episodes, and we'll continue to discuss as it's central to understanding Shintoism, to which modern Japanese culture is still closely connected. Kami are spirits that inhabit everything in the world, from Trees to rocks to water. They're the hidden spirits or energy that one might pray to for a better life. Yokai, on the other hand, range from malevolent to virtuous and everything in between. They can be mischievous or playful and are often allegorical characters, teaching us how we should interact with the world around us. The meaning of the word yokai is something like strange apparition. And the two kanji that make up the word mean suspicious or doubtful. These key words and definitions give us an idea about what yokai are, but still don't even come close to telling the full story. A lot of words in Japanese just can't be properly translated into English, and it's quite a common refrain that yokai is one of these troublesome terms. In fact, be careful about which words you use as a stand in for yokai when speaking English, as nothing else quite covers it. Perhaps it's best just to adopt the word into the English language. The concept of yokai has ancient origins, going back well over a thousand years and likely longer than that. In the 13th century, there were a lot of painted scrolls of yokai being made, featuring those resembling animals as well as man made objects. I actually find this fascinating. The fact there were yokai with human and animal characteristics didn't shock me too much, but I was somewhat surprised that there were yokai of anthropomorphic tools and other items appearing in art from so many years ago. Maybe that's just me, though. I don't know. Are, are you surprised by that?、Um, people at the time were scared of yokai, but making art of them allowed people to sort of tame them. In a sense, they were taking control of them. Instead of fearing these invisible entities, they were giving them form and containing them within a scroll. Taking yokai out of their original context often makes them more lovable and less fearsome. And the further we move from the original stories, the more this happens. Kappa plushies are a far cry from the original story of these humanoid turtles. I'll come back to the kappa later, though. There are many classical Japanese texts that talk about spirits and demons like yokai, including the Shoku Nihongi, the Pillow Book, Taiheiki, and even the oldest surviving text in Japan, the Kojiki, contains myths and legends about yokai.、Um, so, just as we are attempting to lay the foundation for future episodes by learning about yokai today, So, too, were those ancient texts laying the foundation of modern Japanese culture. Collections of stories about monsters and spirits were popular in the Heian period, between the 8th and 12th centuries, and this is around the time we find written records of Hyaki Yagyo, which are like gatherings or parades of hundreds or even thousands of demons. Though it should be noted that these large scale gatherings of yokai became far more prominent during the Muromachi period, which lasted from 1336 to 1573. We see a lot of scenes 
representing these huge processions of yokai in artwork from the Muromachi and Edo periods, as well as in the modern day, in movies like Spirited Away. Uh, Think of the scene near the beginning of Spirited Away, with all the monsters walking across the bridge toward the hot springs, or onsen. It's quite reminiscent of Hyaki Yagyo. There's actually a myth that says anyone who witnesses a Hyaki Yagyo will be spirited away by the yokai. This type of ghost parade is also featured in the Ghibli movie Pompoko, which is an environmental allegory featuring tanuki, um, which are both yokai and real animals, Japanese raccoon dogs. You'll often see tanuki statues outside of restaurants or homes in Japan as a symbol of good luck. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that yokai were often depicted as doing the things that humans do, It's kind of like they exist in a parallel universe and can step in and out of our world when necessary. And maybe we humans sometimes stray into their world when we get sleepy or or drunk or when we behave badly or been isolated for too long. Just, Just something to think about. So if you've ever read the older versions of European fairy tales, you've probably noticed that they are absolutely terrifying and much more brutal and violent than the more well-known versions that would come later, after the Grimm's and Disney had gotten to them. Well, the same thing happened with yokai. They were generally a lot scarier when the world was a more mysterious place. That is, when there were more unexplained phenomena to account for. But as time went on, they slowly morphed into a form of entertainment for both adults and children to enjoy. And I want you to think about that as we go on. What's the reason for this? And were yokai more useful in the past than they are today? Anyway, it was in the Muromachi period that this shift became apparent, with the rise of otogizoshi, which were illustrated short stories. The name otogizoshi actually comes from one particular collection of 23 short stories produced in the Edo period, but was applied more broadly to refer to works of the same genre. And they were still scary to people, but it was scary entertainment, as opposed to real everyday fear that a kappa was going to pop out from under a bridge and drag you into the Kamo River. Um, Okay, a little side note here, just because I mentioned those pesky kappa again. It's interesting to think about how certain yokai became famous over time, while others faded into obscurity. It kind of reminds me of Japan's modern-day obsession with characters like Hello Kitty or Gudetama or something like that. We know the famous ones, but what a lot of us don't really think about is the fact that there are thousands of artists working to create characters like this and never having them gain significant public recognition. If you have the Line app, which is a popular messaging app in Japan, Just scroll through the sticker shop and see all the wonderful characters artists have created that you've never seen before. Um, There's actually tons of Kappa characters on there. Anyway, yokai continued to gain popularity in the Edo period. They were often depicted in the ukiyo-e woodblock printing of that time, including works by famous artists such as Utagawa Kuniyoshi and our old friend Katsushika Hokusai, who we covered in a previous episode. One thing I mentioned in that episode was Hokusai's horror series, 100 Ghost Stories, which consisted of woodblock prints depicting different yokai. It includes some of my favorite ukiyo-e works, and you should definitely check it out if you haven't. Telling scary stories was a popular pastime in the Edo era, just as it is in modern Japan with movies like Cure, which I talked about two weeks ago, or even in horror manga like the works of Junji Ito. It was likely due in part to the advent of the printing press that yokai saw a boon in popularity during the Edo period. Before then, depictions of yokai were mostly limited to places like shrines and temples, with some exceptions, of course, but thanks in large part to the printing press, they could now be widely enjoyed by all, similar to what happened with other subjects of art and literature at that time. As I mentioned in previous episodes, Ukiyo-e prints and poetry like haiku grew in popularity in just the same way. And if you're enjoying this episode, go back and listen to the ones on Hokusai and Matsuo Basho as well. 
between these three episodes, I think we're really starting to form a comprehensive understanding of the Edo period in Japan. In this era, we also start to see a kind of standardization of people's ideas about some of the popular yokai. Whereas before there might have been lots of different interpretations of a yokai such as a kappa, people now had more or less the same idea of the creature. What it looked like, what it did. This isn't so different from what happened with mythical creatures such as vampires in other parts of the world. Popular yokai were even featured on playing cards called karuta, which were introduced to Japan by the Portuguese in the 16th century, as well as many other types of games and toys. This was another way for people to tame the yokai, to gain power over all the unknown things in their world that yokai represented. One of the most important figures in the history of yokai is Toriyama Sekien, who was an author and artist in Edo-era Japan. Perhaps his most famous work, Sekien's Night Parade of a Hundred Demons, is still really fun to flip through. It's kind of like an encyclopedia of yokai, depicting a whole bunch of different ghouls and spirits page by page. Whereas Sekien's work showed the yokai one by one, a lot of other artists' interpretations show all the yokai together, marching through the streets, a much more literal parade than Sekien's seminal work. The Edo period came to a close, and Japan opened up to the world thanks to an event known as the Meiji Restoration. After the Meiji Restoration, European fairy tales like those collected by the Brothers Grimm reached Japan's shores. Some of these became intertwined with stories of yokai over time. For example, the grim fairy tale Godfather Death helped boost the popularity of Shinigami, or Kami of Death, in turn-of-the-century Japan. And as the title suggests, it's a pretty dark story about a man who gives his son away to a personified version of death, something like the Grim Reaper. So that should give you an idea of what kind of stories were popular at the time. Yes, the history of horror runs deep in Japan, and worldwide for that matter. Just because there are so many bad horror movies out there these days doesn't mean we should dismiss such a timeless genre. Yokai even started to appear in rakugo performances and kabuki plays. Rakugo, for those unfamiliar, is a type of one-man show where a lone performer sits on stage and tells a story. It's often comedic, and is kind of like the traditional form of Japanese stand-up comedy. It's much more subdued than kabuki, uh, which involves elaborate costumes, acting, and dancing. Legendary kabuki actors, such as the members of the Onoe family, took on roles such as the kappa, tanuki, and even the kasa ippon ashi, or one-legged umbrella. So, if you've been to Japan, you'll know that there are umbrella racks, at most stores for you to leave your wet umbrella on a rainy day. Um, and a friend of mine told me that if I took someone else's umbrella from the rack, I would actually be haunted by one of these kasa obake, or umbrella yokai. So this yokai has always stuck with me since then. There's a bunch of other stories related to these yokai, but that's just the one that I've heard, and I'm happy I did. Every time I use an umbrella rack now, I think of the kasa obake, and it makes my day a little more interesting. All right, so we've laid down the history of yokai a little bit. Now let's look at a few more types of yokai. The hitotsu mekozo looks like a child with one eye. It roams around towns and looks for shoes that have been left outside by children. If it finds them, it'll stamp the shoe and the owner will then fall ill. The way to ward off this yokai is to hang a woven colander in front of your house, which will scare it off, apparently because the colander looks like a face with many eyes on it. Hitotsume Kozo may actually have its origins in ironworking towns. Iron workers would look into their furnaces, which were very bright, and this would often damage their eyes and sometimes make them go blind in one eye. The idea behind yokai like Hitotsume Kozo is that there's always something watching you, taking note of whether you're acting in a pro-social or anti-social manner, not unlike what Santa Claus does in countries with Christian traditions. Next, we have the Amabie, 
which is kind of like a mermaid that comes out of the ocean to warn people of coming epidemics. As the legend goes, you have to draw its form if you want to avoid falling ill. Doesn't that just feel like the, the plot of a movie or something? It, it kind of reminds me of in The Ring, where they have to copy the videotape. Amabie actually became popular again during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was all over social media and even made an appearance on official government websites alongside information about COVID. Amabie has three legs and a beak like a bird, and it's believed to have come from the Himeuo, another yokai which had the body of a fish with a woman's head and some horns. Himeuo came out of the water and spoke a prophecy, similar to that of the Amabie. One important thing to note here is that this yokai gained popularity during the Edo period, when, as I mentioned earlier, Japan had strict isolationist policies. However, Nagasaki was one of the only places that had ports that would open to foreigners, though only a couple times per year. Even so, Nagasaki began to be seen as almost a foreign country within Japan, and one of the most exotic places most people had access to. This made it the perfect location for strange and mysterious creatures to come from. There was also a fear, and probably not a completely unfounded one, that foreigners coming to Nagasaki were bringing diseases with them, such as smallpox and the flu. So it's no coincidence that Himeo came from the ocean, just like the foreign ships coming into the port. Through, though the ships brought disease, and Himeuo brought a cure. What a great marketing strategy, by the way. Draw Himeuo and spread its image around if you want to survive the epidemic. Another popular yokai at the time was the Kudan, which had the head of a human and the body of a cow. Kudan die shortly after being born, but not before making a prophecy. Kudan and Amabie are both prophetic beasts, which was a popular sort of subgenre of yokai in the Edo period. All right, now for one of the superstars of the yokai world. You've been waiting for it, the Kappa. I've sprinkled this name throughout the episode, but haven't fully described it. They're usually depicted as water-dwelling humanoids with turtle shells on their backs and dishes full of water on their heads. If too much water spills out, they will become weak, and they might even die. Some depictions of Kappa actually do look pretty creepy to me. Very uncanny valley type of thing. They live in rivers, and in the past, drownings were often attributed to these yokai pulling people into the water. They're apparently able to do so with ease, as they're said to be great wrestlers. Kappa statues can also be found at many shrines throughout Japan, and People often bring them cucumbers as an offering, as it's supposedly their favorite food. There's honestly so much more on Kappa, but you can see how these myths evolve over time to become more complex and varied. Uh, one more I want to mention is the Zashiki Warashi. These yokai generally look like young girls and inhabit old buildings, such as ryokan, which are traditional Japanese inns. Most people I've spoken to say they actually like Zashiki Warashi and see them as benevolent. Um, they might be tricksters, but the general consensus seems to be that they're not scary and won't do any real harm. In fact, they're sometimes seen as bringing good luck to those who see them. Again, I, I love these stories because now next time I go to a ryokan, I'll have a heightened awareness of the energy in the building and... We'll be able to feel the magic in the walls and the tatami mats of the place. E everything comes alive, right? So we've seen the yokai go from local myths to something quasi-religious to paintings and plays. And now we've come to the Showa era, which lasted from the 1920s to the 1980s. And we see the rise of manga and anime. One manga that is synonymous with yokai is Gegege no Kitaro, which was created by Shigeru Mizuki in 1960. It became so popular that his hometown of Sakai Minato in Tottori Prefecture is full of statues of his characters. Mizuki started drawing yokai after coming home from World War II. While at war, he got lost in the jungle, 
and while walking through the jungle at night, he suddenly felt like there was a wall in front of him, though he couldn't see it through the blackness. He felt like he couldn't move forward anymore and decided to lay down to sleep for the night. When he woke up, he found that there was a cliff just beyond where he'd been walking and that he would have surely died had he kept marching on blindly. After this, he believed that a wall-type yokai had saved his life, so it's really no wonder that he pretty much dedicated his life to telling stories about yokai. Shigeru Mizuki placed yokai into four categories. The supernatural, shapeshifters, ghosts and spirits, and large monsters. This is just Mizuki's classification system. Many others have chosen to separate yokai into different categories, sometimes based on their appearance, but also on their location or the phenomena with which they are associated. There are tons more anime, manga, and games featuring yokai, and I'll, I'll quickly go through a few of them now. A lot of Studio Ghibli films have featured yokai, including Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, and Pompoko. The word Mononoke, as in Princess Mononoke, is actually somewhat similar to the word yokai. It means vengeful spirit, or something similar to that. There are yokai called Kodama in the film. These are tree spirits, and they aren't an invention of writer-director Hayao Miyazaki. They've actually been written about since the 8th century, and were featured in texts such as the Kojiki. Kodama are said to live in old trees and will curse those who chop the trees down. And just a little reminder, like all yokai, there are many different stories and interpretations, and I'm only giving a very brief overview here. Princess Mononoke also has a wolf yokai in it, including a mother wolf, which has two tails. That's a characteristic of several yokai, including the kitsune and sometimes the inugami, which are fox and dog type yokai, respectively. There are a number of yokai associated with dogs or wolves, an another of which is the okuri inu, which will stalk closely behind hikers on mountain paths, and if they fall, the yokai will pounce on them and attack. However, there is a dual nature to these creatures, as is the case with so many yokai, and as long as you stay upright, the dog or wolf will actually act as a protector against the dangers on the mountain and guide you to safety. If you've seen Princess Mononoke, then you'll remember the huge translucent black monster at the end of the movie that makes all the townspeople and inhabitants of the forest run for their lives. This is sometimes interpreted to be a daidarabochi, which is a huge yokai that can actually take the form of a mountain or even a mountain range. Now let's look at another Ghibli film, Spirited Away. This one is absolutely chock full of yokai, but I'll just mention a couple here. The character No Face might be based off the yokai Umibozu, which is actually a sea spirit that attacks ships and kills sailors. My research on Umibozu didn't really reveal many redeeming qualities, but No Face from Spirited Away has the characteristic benevolent and malevolent sides that many other yokai tend to possess. He seems to go crazy while he's in the bathhouse, but is calm and kind once he's outside. There are also Namahage, or Oni, looking characters in the film, which are classic demon or ogre creatures with devil horns on their heads. These are monsters that live in mountain caves, emerging periodically to eat people. And one of the stories told to children in Japan is that if they misbehave, they will be eaten by a namahage. This is the type of story that the main character, Sen, also known as Chihiro, would have likely been told by her parents. By the way, Spirited Away is called Sen to Chihiro in Japanese. Oni are ubiquitous, and you'll surely see them in art, statues, or masks all over Japan. Clearly, Miyazaki and the Ghibli team have been inspired by yokai and other forms of Japanese mythology, but the legacy of these spirits goes much deeper than just one studio, legendary though it is. One anime I really like that keeps the yokai tradition alive is Rumiko Takahashi's Inuyasha, there's a Tanuki character, Hachiemon, who is a shapeshifter and benevolent, 
on-again, off-again member of Inuyasha's crew. Inuyasha himself is part dog demon, and you can definitely see the dichotomy of good and evil within him, especially earlier in the series. There are also a couple of characters that are based off of Kitsune, Shippo, who is a young humanoid fox, and Kirada, who is more like an animal, standing on all fours and not speaking Japanese or any other human language. Both of them are shapeshifters, and Kirada has multiple tails, as many kitsune do. By the way, kitsune is the word for fox in Japanese, as well as for fox yokai, just as tanuki is used for raccoon dogs and their yokai counterparts. I actually love this, and ever since I learned it, I have a newfound reverence for foxes. It added some extra magic to them. One great representative example of a kitsune is Ninetales from Pokemon. Even the name of this Pokemon is a reference to the legend that tells that as kitsune get older and wiser, they grow more and more tails, with most stories saying that nine is the maximum number. Oh, by the way, Shippo means tail in Japanese, so that little fox character from Inuyasha is named Tail, very apropos. He's also a bit of a trickster, which is a classic kitsune trait. Okay, just one last thing on kitsune for today that I think is pretty cool. In Japan, sun showers are sometimes referred to as kitsune no yomeiri, meaning fox's wedding. Again, they're assigning something mythical to a strange phenomenon. There are lots of different legends about foxes' weddings, but apparently it was often seen as bad luck to witness a kitsune's wedding ceremony, which is a shame because that would be such a cool thing to see. This is related to the idea of the hyakki yagyo, or yokai parades I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. It seems as though it's just bad luck most times when you see a whole bunch of yokai at once, which makes sense to me. I'll, I'll run through a few more Pokemon based off yokai very quickly. Dunsparce is a Tsuchinoko, which is like a stubby little snake. Drowsy is a Baku, or Nightmare Eater. If you've played the game, that makes sense. Lickitung is an Akaname, which licks the scum off of bathroom tiles and things like that. Executor is a Jinmenju, a tree with human heads in it. Magmar is a Basan, kind of like a phoenix. And Golduck might have been inspired by the Kappa, though it's far from being a perfect representation. It still kind of gives off a Kappa vibe to me, though. So, one question that has come up again and again throughout my research on yokai. Have they lost their power in the modern world, in a world that's becoming increasingly disenchanted. Now that science has shed light on a lot of previously unexplained phenomena that yokai used to explain for us, what is their place in the world? Well, I don't believe yokai have lost their power. In fact, they might be more important than ever in keeping some of the magic of this world alive. When we feel like our lives are just a straight line from birth to school to work to death, then yokai are the things that lead us down a meandering path that makes life interesting again. And isn't that what all stories are? The movies we love, the books we get lost in? Yokai connect us to the past, and maybe to other dimensions, not seen but imagined. Even if they don't exist in corporeal form, they most certainly do exist as a testament to the collective creativity of the human species as something people have built together over centuries, and that's more significant than any scientific journal with a half-life of three or four years. All right, I, I think I had something there before my unwarranted attack on science, but the point is I love yokai, and I hope we can keep building the tradition for thousands of years to come. Anyway, that's it for our main topic today. But it won't be the last time we talk about yokai here on Japan Media Tour. And before we go, stay tuned for today's bonus topic and recommendations. All right, thanks for sticking around. Today I just want to talk about a glorious Japanese animal that sadly went extinct in the early 20th century. The Japanese wolf also known as the Honshu wolf, 
was a subspecies of the gray wolf that once roamed the islands of Kyushu, Shikoku, and of course, Honshu, Japan's largest and most populous island. A number of factors led to the decline and eventual eradication of the Japanese wolf, including the introduction of rabies and other diseases, as well as Meiji-era policies that led to increased hunting and culling of wolves. However, if you search online, you'll quickly find that a growing number of people are reporting wolf sightings all across Japan, and they have the photos to prove it. Now, I'm not saying these photos are undeniable proof that the Japanese wolf lives on, but they're certainly intriguing. It's interesting when something like this happens, and a real animal becomes something of a cryptid. It's, uh, we, we've seen this before with uh, Tasmanian tigers or the coelacanth. The coelacanth, by the way, turned out not to be extinct at all, and people have actually found a few over the past hundred years. Coelacanth are fish, though, so it's a bit different. They can hide under the water and whatnot. But could there really be wolves living in such a populous country as Japan? I'm not sure, but I hope so. They're beautiful creatures, and even if there aren't any left, certain environmental groups in Japan are seeking government approval to introduce gray wolves to the country. To mix reviews, of course. I understand why some people don't want them to come back. They look pretty scary. And we don't really know what effect they would have on indigenous animal populations, but it's a fascinating prospect nonetheless. Japanese wolves are slightly smaller than their cousins in mainland Asia and North America, standing about 50 to 60 centimeters tall. You can see stuffed and mounted specimens at Wakayama University, Tokyo University, and apparently the National Museum of Natural History in the Netherlands for some reason. There's actually a story in the news right now about a 13-year-old girl who discovered a specimen thought to be a Japanese wolf at the National Museum of Nature and Science. I, I said a minute ago that it feels like the wolf has now become a cryptid alongside Sasquatch and the Loch Ness Monster, but really it's kind of become like a yokai out there in the mountains where most people will never see it. I guess most wolves are kind of like that. Even in places where they haven't been eradicated, you never really see them when you're out in the wilderness. Even if they're around you, they know you're coming long before you get the chance to catch a glimpse of one. Anyway, that's all I've got for you on wolves for now. I'll keep watching the news, see if anything pops up. Um, wolves, by the way, in Japanese are called okami. Um, all right, so stay tuned for this week's recommendation and to hear about next week's episode. For today's recommendation, I think I should send you to a shrine, somewhere you might be able to see some yokai or at least feel their presence. Oiwa Shrine is located in Hitachi City, Ibaraki Prefecture. It's a bit out of the way, but it's a beautiful place, surrounded by natural beauty. The shrine is on Mount Oiwa, so you can have a look around and then enjoy a tranquil hike under the giant cedar trees. Maybe even bring a couple Hitachi no Nest beers to drink at the top of the mountain. They're brewed not far away at Kiyuchi Brewery. By the way, Oiwa Shrine is also home to a legendary cedar tree, called the Sambon Sugi. So, and being in the presence of a natural wonder like that really does feel like you're meeting a god or something, not to mention the breathtaking views from the top of the mountain. It, it really is God's country. So I'd recommend Oiwa Shrine to those that live in Japan, or perhaps to those who might already be planning to spend time nearby. But it's a bit far to go if you're on a tight schedule, uh, especially if you're just heading from Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, you know, the classic route. Um, so I'll throw in a bonus rec, as I am want to do. Uh, so how about some noodles? There's a little spot in the south end of Kyoto called Yamabiko Fushimi, and they make really good udon noodles. Uh, the reason I picked this spot is because of the dish Kitsune Udon, which is udon with some sweet tofu on top. Apparently foxes like to eat this, 
hence the name. Uh, that item is on the menu, but they have a bunch of other good ones like curry udon or zaru udon, which is cold noodles with a dipping sauce. And I, I think it's cash only, as a lot of places in Japan are, so just be ready for that. Um, it's pretty far from downtown Kyoto, though, so sorry for sending you to such off the beaten path locations this week. Um, and I've already thought about next episode's recommendation, and I think I'm sending you pretty far away again, actually. But、uh, maybe the week after that, I'll, I'll put something in the city.、Um, I'm really excited for next week's episode, though. I'm a visual artist, so anytime I get to talk about art on the pod, I'm happy. And next time we're going to talk about Yayoi Kusama, probably Japan's most famous contemporary artist. And if not, she's certainly one of them. I guess her challengers would probably be manga and anime artists, right?、Um, but anyway, her story is fascinating and it spans decades. So, there will be a lot of information that you won't want to miss. So, thanks for joining me today. This is Stephen TM signing off, and I'll see you next time for Yayoi Kusama. <laughs>